Hello everyone. What you doing, buggers? What you doing, buggers? Waiting to get to 20 concurrent viewers and then I'll start. There we go. All right. Um, so I'm going to finish up the um, angular momentum lesson that I didn't get the chance to finish because of the shortened um, class period on um, Tuesday. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, let me make sure this is focused. It's my first class of the day. Um, Okay, so let me remind you what we were talking about. So last time we were discussing angular momentum. Uh, which is denoted by L. Okay. And there are kind of two different types of angular momentum. Uh, they're both angular momentum, but it's useful to divide the angular momentum into two different categories. Um, one type of angular momentum is called the um, orbital angular momentum. And so when you think about orbital angular momentum, um, you think about something moving as a whole around some central point, okay? And so here's the central point. The distance from the central point is denoted by R, and so the orbital angular momentum is the mass of the object times its speed times the radius of its orbit, okay? So that is called orbital angular momentum, it's associated with the motion as a whole around a central point, okay? Um, the second type of angular momentum is called spin angular momentum. And so spin has to do with not the angular momentum not associated with the object moving as a whole, okay? It has to do with the object spinning or rotating in place, whether or not it's moving. Okay, it's going from um, place to place. Um, and the spin angular momentum has to do with the rate of rotation. And so the rate of rotation is denoted by omega, also known as the angular velocity. Okay. Um, all right, and then uh, you multiply that by the inertia of the object. Okay, um, and so the total angular momentum of a single object the total angular momentum of a single object is going to be the object's spin angular momentum plus an object's orbital angular momentum. Okay, so that's the total for a single object. Um, the total angular momentum of a system 
okay, which consists of multiple objects, is going to be the angular momentum of each one added together. Okay, so a, a good example of that is what if we considered the Earth-Moon system? Okay, um, and we'll ignore the fact that the Earth is actually orbiting around the Sun. Okay, so we'll just consider like the Earth is the center of the system. Um, the angular momentum of the Earth would be only spin angular momentum because the Earth is at the center of the system and it's spinning in place, okay? The moon has an orbital angular momentum because it's going around the Earth, okay? And then it also has spin angular momentum because as it's orbiting, it is spinning. So we kind of have two sources of spin angular momentum and one source of orbital angular momentum. Okay, and so um, what I told you guys is that um, if um, if there is no torque on the system. And that's the important, um, excuse me, that's an important if. Torque changes angular momentum. Torque makes things spin more or less. If you have no torque on the system, then the amount of spinning is going to stay the same. So the initial angular momentum is going to equal the final angular momentum. Okay? Um, so that's what we learned last time. Uh, so today we're pretty much just going to do examples. Um, I don't really feel like plugging in numbers and doing lots of calculator work today, so I, th I think I'm just going to sort of describe these examples um, abstractly, okay? Um, okay, so um, what if we have a disk okay and here's the disk um, it's a solid disk so the inertia of a solid disk is um, okay one half m r squared where r is the radius of the disk little r is the radius of the disk Okay, that's supposed to say little r. Okay, um, the disk is spinning with an angular velocity of omega. All right, now this disk as a whole is also orbiting around a central point with a radius r. Okay. And the time it takes to go around is the period. Time for the disk to orbit. Okay? And so I want to know, what is the total angular momentum of the disk? All right? So because the disk is spinning, it's going to have spin angular momentum. And because it's orbiting around this central point, it's going to have orbital angular momentum. So the total angular momentum of the disk is going to be its um, orbital plus its spin. All right. So the orbital angular momentum is m v, and I'm going to use big R because big R is the radius of the orbit, which is different from the radius of the disk. Little r is the radius of the disk. Okay. Then we have plus I omega. All right. Um, 
So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go one step further. All right. The inertia, I know that the inertia of a solid disk is one half mR squared. So for inertia, I'm going to plug in one half um, m r squared, where that is little r, which is the radius of the disk itself, not the disk's orbit. Um, okay, so there's the spin angular momentum. Um, for the orbital angular momentum, notice that I didn't give the actual orbital speed. Okay, um, and you might recall from circular motion that the orbital speed is 2 pi r divided by the period. Okay, because the circumference of the circle is 2 pi r, and then the period is the time it takes to go around, so distance traveled over time. So I have plus m times plugs. times 2 pi r over the period times the radius. Okay. Um, bugger! It sounded like he was in the front yard, and he's not supposed to be in the front yard. Here you are, little man. So, um, so what I've basically done here is I've shown you all the components of calculating the total angular momentum of a spinning and orbiting object. We have the orbital angular momentum here and the spin angular momentum here. Okay. Um, so that example doesn't really have to do with um, conservation of angular momentum. So let's talk about... Um, conservation of angular momentum, okay? Um, a, a great example of that is a, um, uh, a figure skater, okay? All right, now a, a figure skater you might have seen a figure skater before. Um, so they're standing on the ice, okay? And they might be doing a little spinny spin. So they're doing a little spinny spin, okay? Here's them spinning, and, and they start out their spins with their arms wide open, wide, and their legs sticked out, is sticking out. And so they're doing a spin, like this. So they have a spin angular momentum. Um, and then, if you're like me and you enjoy watching figure skaters, figure skating during the Olympics, um, you know that they eventually pull their arm in. Okay? They pull their arms in. So they'll kind of go, um, this maybe I'm trying to visualize what it looks like in my head. Okay, so they'll kind of pull their body in. All right. Um, and so when they do that, they start to spin faster. All right. Um, so as they go from this pose to that pose, they spin faster. Um, so the question is why? And it has to do with conservation of angular momentum. So um, if we think about conservation of angular momentum, this figure skater is spinning. They're not orbiting. So the angular momentum of the figure skater is I times omega, okay? Um, and if we think about the inertia, okay, 
um, inertia is the sum of m r squared, where r is the distance from the axis of rotation. So what happens when um, the figure skater pulls their arms in is they reduce the r value of a lot of their mass. They're pulling their arms in closer to the axis of rotation. So r goes down, okay? And because r goes down, the inertia is gonna also go down, all right? So that means that in our formula for angular momentum, the inertia goes down, all right? Um, but because the total amount of angular momentum has to remain constant, the angular velocity is going to increase in order to keep this product constant. So they spin faster. So that's why the figure skater speeds up when they pull their arms in. It's because of the conservation um, of angular momentum. Okay. Uh, this this also has a lot of um, this explanation also has a lot of implications for um, astrophysics, believe it or not. And the reason is um, when a star reaches the end of its life, uh, it it runs out of fuel. Okay, if we think about a star in outer space, it's basically an explosion. But the explosion can't expand because of the gravity of the star. Okay, so you have this explosion, um, and all stars are are rotating. Okay, stars are rotating about an axis just like a planet would. Um, and so what happens is is the star at the end of its life it runs out of fuel. Okay, so you have a star. Um, it runs out of fuel. So there's no explosions on the inside propping the star up and making it have the size that it has. So gravity shrinks the star down. Okay. And as it shrinks, that reduces the rotational inertia of the star, which then causes the star to spin faster. Okay. Um, causes the star to spin faster. So basically, um, after a star dies, it's oftentimes spinning very, very fast. Just like a figure skater, when they pull their arms in, the star shrinks, pulls itself in, it spins faster. Um, so we have uh, neutron, there's a couple of different possibilities for what happens to a star. One of the possibilities is a neutron star. Neutron stars um, are often spinning incredibly fast. And same thing with black holes. If a star becomes a black hole, it will oftentimes be spinning um, incredibly fast. Okay. Um, let's do another example. And the other example is um, stacked disks. Okay, um, so I'll, I'll do like maybe an Italian example here. So suppose you're making a pizza. Okay, here's the pizza dough. Okay, um, here's the center of the pizza dough. The pizza dough is, is um, it has an inertia i, we'll call it i1, and it's spinning at a rate omega 1. Okay, so it's like someone making a pizza, so that it's this disc of dough and they're spinning it. Okay, and let's say it's a pepperoni pizza. So they're going to drop a pepperoni onto the center of the pizza. All right, so the pepperoni looks like this. 
okay? The, the pepperoni has its own inertia, which I'll call I2, and it has its own rate of spin, which I will call omega-2, okay? Um, so the, the pepperoni gets dropped onto the pizza, okay? So, um, so this is kind of before, and then after we have the pizza dough. By the way, this is kind of a 3D perspective. So, you know, if we were looking at this from above, it would look like this, but we're kind of viewing it edge on. So the, the fact that this is actually a circle, it kind of looks like an oval because we're viewing it from the edge. Um, so now we have the, the um, pizza with the single pepperoni in the center. And uh, because of the pepperoni, landing on top of the pizza, they're going to be spinning at a different rate. It's going to affect when two things that are spinning at different rates interact with each other. They collide with each other, okay, and eventually they start to spin together, okay. So they're going to have some final spin rate. And our question is, what is the final spin rate? Um, so if we think about the initial angular momentum, it's two spinning things. So if you have separate objects in your system, you just add the angular momentum, okay? Um, so our initial angular momentum is going to be I1 times omega 1 plus I2 times omega 2. All right. Um, our final angular momentum, these, the pepperoni and the pizza dough have basically combined into one object. So their angular, or so their inertias are going to add together. Okay. And because they've combined into one object, they have the same spin rate. Okay. So they're, they're one object with their inertias adding together and a final spin rate like that. So we could use this master equation, if you will, to solve for omega final. All right. Um, so that's if you have stacked disks. That's kind of a useful question. Um, one thing I want to point out is if um, if one object is spinning clockwise, the other one is spinning counterclockwise, you have to worry about the sign of omega. Because omega, the omegas could be positive or negative. Um, let's do a couple more. Uh, okay. So uh, this example is going to be hopping on a merry-go-round. Okay. Um, so let's imagine a merry-go-round from a top view. Okay, um, so the merry-go-round is here. The merry-go-round has an inertia I, and it is spinning at a rate of omega. Okay, and we'll say that the merry-go-round has a radius R. There's a person who is standing right here. So this is a top view of the person. The person is um, stationary. All right. Um, 
Bug, are you okay? What's wrong? He just made a yip. Um, so because the person is stationary, the person has no orbital or spin angular momentum. Okay? So if I think about what is the total angular momentum of this system, it's just going to be I omega. So that's the angular momentum of the merry-go-round. Okay? Um, then what happens is the person steps onto the edge of the merry-go-round. Okay? So now this person is on the edge. All right? And as a result, because you have added a person, you're sort of adding mass to the merry-go-round, so it's going to spin more slowly. Okay? And so what we want to know is what is the final spin rate? Okay? Um, now, because the person is on the merry-go-round, the person is going around with the same um, angular velocity. Okay? So the, the final angular velocity is going to be, again, I omega final, but the inertia has changed because the person has hopped onto the edge. Okay? Um, so what is the what happens to the inertia as a result of the person hopping on is the inertia is going to increase. So a person has an inertia. If the person is going around the merry-go-round, they're a distance r from the center. Okay, so the inertia of the person is going to be m r squared. Right, because inertia is sum of mr squared. All right, so what that means is that the new angular momentum, or sorry, the new inertia is going to be the original inertia of just the merry-go-round plus the additional inertia from the person who hopped on. Okay. Um, so there's an equation, and we could solve for omega final. All right. Um, so there's a nice little example. And I think we'll do one more. There's a lot of examples. Um, so the last example that I want to do for today is, um, now I'm blanking, hopping on a merry-go-round. Part two. Okay. Um, so again, let's think about the top view of a merry-go-round and again the merry-go-round has a radius r and it has an inertia i okay um, and the merry-go-round is initially stationary okay so that means that the merry-go-round starts out with no angular momentum. Then a person of mass m runs with a speed v towards the merry-go-round. Okay. Um, and then hops on the edge of the merry-go-round. So they hop on the merry-go-round, and once they hop on, the merry-go-round starts to spin. Okay? And so what we would like to know is what is the final spin rate?
Okay. Now, if, if we think about this, um, the initial angular momentum is going to be the angular momentum of the disk plus the angular momentum of the person. The disk doesn't have any angular momentum to start out with. It's only the person. The person is um, the person is not spinning. They're actually orbiting. Okay, so the person is orbiting this location, right? So the person runs in. So the initial angular momentum is going to be the orbital angular momentum of the person. Okay, the person does not have spin angular momentum because they're not twirling around in place, right? They're running from place to place. So the initial angular momentum is MVR, the orbital angular momentum of the person. Okay. Um, afterwards, the system is spinning, right? Because this is a merry-go-round. So afterwards, we have spin angular momentum, where it's the total angular momentum, or the total inertia times omega final. Okay? Now, what is the total iner inertia of the merry-go-round plus the person on the edge? It's exactly the same as before. Okay? So we have um, the inertia of the merry-go-round plus the inertia of the person on the edge of the merry-go-round times omega final. So this equation right here expresses angular momentum conservation. We could use it to solve for whatever we want to um, solve for. Okay. Um, so I have one last thing for today. Um, as I said, torques change angular momentum. Torques change angular momentum. Um, so the question is, how? So I'm going to give you a, a nice little equation for it. And the equation is this. The net torque is equal to the rate of change of angular momentum. Okay, so the bigger the torque is, the faster the angular momentum changes. Um, you could think about this as the sneaky form of Newton's second law for rotations. Um, you might recall the sneaky form of Newton's second law was net force equals rate of change of linear momentum. So this, these equations are completely analogous. As I discussed, there's an analogy between linear motion and rotational motion. So these, you know, torque is analogous to force. Angular momentum is analogous to linear momentum. Okay? Um, so that is today's uh, lesson, and I will see you in the Zoom room.